So I ask permission from Lumpo Kham, our visiting teacher, and the Sangha here just to speak a few words on the Dhamma for you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, We've travelled here from Melbourne this morning. I brought our visiting teacher, Venerable Lumpur Kham, who lives in uh, Ubon Rajatani in a monastery called Wat Thai Patana. Um, and he's one of the oldest living disciples of Ajahn Chah. He's been a monk for 57 years. So it's a great blessing for us all to have him here with us today. Um, he's travelling around Australia viewing the monasteries so you are all, all on view today <laughs> but he's already very impressed with your practice you've all um, offered food and as agenda Masiya mentioned you've taken the precepts listened to the chanting very respectfully you're all able to sit on the floor um, mindfully respectfully this is already something very special um, today is a what we call a papa, an offering of forest cloth. And Venerable Ajahn Dhammasiya has already given you some teaching about cloth. So maybe I'll talk a bit about forest, <laughs> forest cloth. Um, we're living and staying in the forest here. Uh, my monastery where I live is the forest. This monastery is the forest. Lumpur Kham lives in the forest in Thailand. Why is that? Why do people choose to go and live in the forest? Why did the Buddha choose to live in the forest? Because the Buddha was born in the forest, practiced in the forest, taught in the forest and died in the forest. Because the forest is a very peaceful place, very natural place, and it provides a good environment for um, the study and practice of the Dhamma what the Buddha taught. It's not always easy living in the forest, as you know. Uh, without being overly critical, it pro you probably all agree, you're all very attached to the comforts of your home. You, that's why you live in the cities and the suburbs. You have nice houses and cars and running water and electricity and entertainments and TVs and computers and food wherever you want, whatever kind of food you want, clothes, you have all the comforts. You come into the forest, it's not the same, is it? You come into the forest, you have to give up some of that comfort. So this is what puts maybe some people off coming into the forest. Why would I go to a forest temple, a forest monastery? You know, what, what's in it for me? <laughs> but you have to see it's um, a monastery is a place where you're pursuing a higher form of happiness. You might say a better kind of happiness, um, which is what the Buddhist teachings are pointing to and leading us towards. Doesn't mean to say you have to live in the forest to practice Buddhism, but it symbolizes something very important. Uh, it symbolizes um, a quality we call nekama, renunciation or letting go. And the Buddhist teachings are based on this principle that we can find a lot of happiness in the world, what we'd call material happiness, from having a strong healthy body or at least having access to good medicine, good food, health care when we are sick having money which we earn to buy things, to buy property and possessions and to travel and to have families and all kinds of good experiences. And we can have that kind of happiness in life. It's true. But the Buddha said it's, it's a very limited kind of happiness. It's uh, also a very dangerous kind of happiness because it doesn't last and it's very uncertain. You know, the material happiness we have depends on so many uncontrollable factors like the economy or our boss 
or our health or the wind and the rain, the climate, all kinds of things that we can't really control. And even when you get it, this happiness we get from material wealth and then what you might call the normal happiness of living in the world doesn't last very long, does it? You, know, you eat a nice meal and it's gone, it's finished. You, even things you buy that might last a long time, like you buy a house, eventually that house will get old and you might have to pull it down and rebuild it or you sell it on and move on somewhere else. Even when you've got it, you're always cleaning it, repairing it. So whatever you look at in the material world, it's, it's temporary kinds of happiness. The pleasures of friends and family, they're true, they're, they exist, but they don't last that long. So the Buddha was pointing out this is a disadvantage for the happiness of the world. It's limited, it's temporary. And a monastery is a place where you pursue or learn about the higher happiness. And part of the, one of the causes for that higher, higher happiness is when you are willing to step aside from or put aside the worldly happiness. Because that takes up a lot of our time, a lot of our interest. If you're always absorbed into chasing after getting more material possessions, more money, more fame, more fortune, more likes on your Facebook page, all the kind of normal things that we associate with success, happiness. You don't have much time to pursue uh, the spiritual life or higher happiness. So a monastery is a place where you come and you do set aside some of that pursuit of material happiness. It's not that you have to really struggle or torture yourself to live in a monastery or even just to visit a monastery. As you've all seen, there's, the food can be quite good in a monastery. <laughs> it's not you don't get food, but you only get once a day in the morning. You give up your evening meal when you stay in a monastery. Um, it's not that there's no buildings or facilities. There's toilets, there's a hall that we're sitting in, there's a car park, there's a library, all kinds of facilities, but they're shared. They're not your own. And some people might think, hmm, that's not what I like. I like to have my own things. But it means you have to give up. Give up some of that sense of ownership and pursuit of your own personal happiness, personal interests. Why? Because now you're turning your attention, your energy to something higher. And that comes partly through this renunciation, just literally letting go for a little while, if only for a few hours, or sometimes for a few days, or some people even ordain their whole life. But you're setting aside the pursuit of material happiness, setting aside your energy, your in interest in that for something <laughs> higher, for doing what we're doing today, come together to make offerings, to offer robes and other things. That takes time, takes energy. You know, some people might think you're foolish. They say, oh, you go to work and you earn all this money and then what, you just give it to the monks? <laughs> but you have to see this is part of our practice. Uh, practicing dana, making offerings to support monasteries, sangha, is one kind of dana, one kind of generosity. There are other kinds of generosity we practice as well. We help the sick, the poor, those who need it. Maybe just a friend in need. There's many ways we help others. But when you do that, you have to give up some of your own personal possessions, money, time, energy. Why would we do that? Again, it's because you're getting some of this higher kind of happiness back. You might not even be seeking that when you do it. You offer these robes today or any other donation. At the time, you're doing it because you have faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. You're doing it because you feel it's a useful, good thing to do, to help to support a place like this on this occasion. So you're not thinking what's in it for me maybe, but there is something in it for you in that every time you remember what you've done, you feel good. Sharing in this occasion, just being here, you probably feel a lot of joy, a lot of happiness. It's a very subtle thing though, that at first you may not yet realize, say somebody who's brand new to Buddhism comes, they might be looking and think, why do they do this? What's the point? But if you've come here a few times 
and you've practiced dana in one form or another, you might start to feel good about what you've done. And it's something useful for others, so other people also benefit. This is the beginning of this seeking of the higher happiness. But it doesn't just stop there. You also come to a forest to practice the listening to the teachings, to contemplate the teachings, think about them more deeply, to learn to meditate, and to make your mind peaceful, and then to understand and see the Dhamma. And a forest is a very good place for that. Forest is not all comfort, convenience. There'll be some comfort here, but there'll be some inconvenience as well. But that can be quite useful for us. Uh, they have a saying in Thailand, not, particularly northeast Thailand, which is a very kind of harsh environment where many of the monks here we've practiced and lived before. They say, no suffering, no wisdom. <laughs> Buddhism is based on this principle as well. We learn from suffering, we learn from the difficulties of life. So a monastery is a place where you learn from difficulties. It's not the same as a five-star hotel or <laughs> a resort or something like that. It's a place you come to learn. And the, But the good thing is that you can even make ex difficult experiences, challenges, something you learn from, something you gain from. So this is another flavor of living in the forest. You know, sometimes it's difficult. The rain comes or the heat of the sun or there's flies or mosquitoes or you're sitting on a floor and your legs hurt, you feel tired. All kinds of unpleasant experiences may come up during your time in the monastery. But instead of just groaning and complaining or running away, you're learning to reflect on your experience. You know, a pain in the leg, or the weather is too hot, or there's a fly bothering you, or whatever it may be. This can all be food for Dhamma, food for learning. And this is something we have to remember. <laughs> that's okay, that's just the um, Devas celebrating the Papa today, or the Nagas. The Nagas love to uh, have thunder and lightning. That's okay. But you learn from your dukkha. You get happiness as well in a monastery, but you may experience some tiredness and difficulty as you're practicing in a monastery, but you use that as food for contemplation and for gaining wisdom. Yesterday, uh, Lumpur Kam was um, hosting a question and answer session at our monastery in Melbourne, and somebody brought up a, a very... Uh, well-worn question about why does Buddhism always teach about suffering <laughs> as a sort of complaint um, and he said well the, the Buddha did teach about suffering but he also taught about the end of suffering and quite often the Buddha would refer to what he was teaching as I teach about suffering I teach about the end of suffering we also learn from Buddhism what we call the four noble truths that we aspire to develop and to understand through our practice. And you all know the first noble truth is the noble truth of suffering. It's a truth. The Buddha was just pointing to the truth that much of our life is mixed up or bound up with suffering. And uh, you know, people often say in a monastery you're not in the real world, you're escaping from reality. But that's not true. All you're doing is turning to look at reality and noticing that a lot of our life is bound up, mixed up with experiences of suffering of one kind or another. Lumpur answered, he said, well, just look at the first thing that happens in your life when you're born. Is it painful or pleasant when a baby is born? Any mother will tell you. you know, your mother goes through excruciating pain. Unfortunately, some mothers die when their children are born. But it's very painful, maybe for many hours of uh, labor, labor pains, many months of carrying a baby around in their womb. And then what does baby do first thing a baby is born? Ooh, cries. <laughs> you know, you see in the movies, I don't know, I haven't been in the hospital when a baby's born, but in the movies you know, they hold the baby up, slap the bum, bum of the baby and they go, Wah! 
you begin your life crying. It's suffering. The baby is saying, oh, here I go, now I've got to go face all this suffering. Another person asked the question, you know, what's wrong with being born again? Because, you know, Nibbana, we practice Buddhism, the fourth noble truth, or the third noble truth is the end of suffering, Niroda. We call that the end of suffering. And we call the highest happiness in Buddhism Nibbana. Why would anyone want to practice for Nibbana? It sounds boring. This young lady said, you know, what's the attraction? It's, they call in Nibbana the highest emptiness. Emptiness, that doesn't sound very attractive. I don't want emptiness. Sounds kind of meaningless. What's the purpose of Nibbana? I've got no problems with being born again. She, she had that view. But you think, well, if you're born again, that means you've got a, another nine months in the womb. Come out, bang, wah! <laughs> you're going to go through it all again. And Lumpur pointed out that it's not guaranteed you'll be even coming back as a human anyway. That would be a, a good outcome. But if you listen to the words of the Buddha, it's not guaranteed. You may come back in somewhere not quite so... Um, happy uh, you may come back as a wallaby on the side of the mountain <laughs> you may come back as a fish in the sea you may come back in a ghost realm or a hell realm this all depends on karma and who can guarantee where what karma they've made where they're going to be born next life it's a bit of a lottery if you look at it so this uh, teaching the Buddha gave on the cycle of birth and death or what we call sangsara, you know, it's not just guaranteed that you finish this life and then you come on to a next life, do it again, have more happiness. It's bound up with a lot of suffering, a lot of uncertainty. And even this life, I think if you're really honest, the Buddha's words, they do make sense. You know, life is bound up with uncertainty, insecurity, danger, and we're always kind of trying to run away or get away from that. So that one of the values of the Buddhist teachings is it gives us some, some certainty, something to move towards, some, a goal, and also a pathway that will lead towards that goal. And you know, yet another question that came up yesterday was, you know, this, this world these days with... Um, uh, globalization and the spread of the internet so now you know everything that's going on all around the world so whether you like it or not you know the political situation in another country you know where the latest floods and wars are you know everything that's going on around the world and they said it seems like the world is just so full of conflict so polarized you know, you're either on the right you're on the left you like this politician you like that politician you like this thing that thing you've got your your particular issues, it seems a very kind of polarized place, full of conflict, full of disharmony. Well, one thing Buddhism can offer within that is what we call the middle way, giving you some real clarity in what is, what is life, why are we here, what's the purpose of it. Our teacher Ajahn Chah used to say, say every day when you get up in the morning, ask yourself, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Is it just to go out, earn money, have family, uh, buy a house, get a mortgage, <laughs> retire, and then you know, go to heaven if you're lucky? Is that what it's all about? Is it about you know, arguing, arguing with your friend over certain issues and politics and so on? Or is there something higher than this? And the Buddha's answer was, yes, there is something higher than this. There's a higher kind of happiness that comes from turning your attention and looking inside. Not always going outside, thinking happiness is in having more things, getting more things, more money, more fame, more fortune. It's not to deny that those things do not bring you some happiness, but it's a very unreliable, unsatisfying kind of happiness. It doesn't really solve the suffering that we go through in human existence. Whereas the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, gives you a much more satisfying result, but it requires a little bit of renunciation and letting go. We have to learn how to let go of some of our um, fi fixation or obsession on these more worldly pursuits, and that's the, the tricky thing. Because maybe most people haven't yet 
I think, seen the dangers in just endlessly pursuing material happiness. Um, it's understandable. We all live in this world and the culture, the society we, in, we live in is, is one that's full of what we call unenlightened, unawakened people. We're all in the same boat, so it's not like anyone's better than anyone else. And when we're unenlightened, unawakened, we tend to get deluded with this sense of self. Always a sense of me and mine. So you go to work, you earn money, you say, my money. And you buy things, you say, my thing, my car, my house. You get married, you say, my husband, my wife, you have children, my children. But this is what we call superficial or conventional reality. It's true on one level and we agree that it's true on that level. You know, we give each other a name and we say this is a house and you can buy a house and you get a title deed to that house and everyone agrees, yes, it's your house, you paid the money. But does the house know that it belongs to you? <laughs> The house doesn't know, does it? The house is just bricks and mortar and timber and other products that we put together. You buy a car, the car doesn't know it belongs to you. The car is just metal and rubber and other things. Even this body that we inhabit, if you look closely, does your body know it's you? <laughs> is this body, is it correct to even say this body is me, mine, it belongs to me? We certainly feel like that, don't we? We think, this is me, I'm here, I'm talking, I'm feeling, I know what I am, I know who I am. But if this body is really you, just order it, do not get tired today, do not feel tired, do not get sick tomorrow or whenever. Ajahn Damasiya got, got a cold, he got sick. If his body was his and belonged to him, he should be able to say, do not get sick body, I've got a lot of visitors coming, I've got to be at peak fitness. You can't say that, can you? Your body doesn't respond because it's not really your body. It's a collection of what we call elements, an earth element, fire, water, it's got temperature, heat and cold. Um, it's a collection of elements and then you have a mind which is really just another element, it's this quality of knowing. We call it the vinyana dhatu, it's the quality of knowing that comes together when you're born, you get a body and a mind as a package. But that body and mind, they don't actually know that they're a self. That's something we learn as we grow up. We get a name and we de de develop our personality and our character, but actually in essence, this body does not belong to anyone. It's a collection of elements, and yet we assume it is us. So, of course, if we get sick, we don't just get sick in the body, we get sick in the mind as well. Sometimes we get sick in the mind before we get in the body. Have you ever had that? We go to the doctor and they say, mm, there's something wrong, and you drop into depression straight away. You don't know yet what's wrong, you just think there may be something wrong. You know, oh, you've got to do a few tests, so you go home in panic. Uh, the mind is suffering already, and the body may be nothing wrong with it. Maybe the tests come back and there's absolutely nothing wrong, but the mind has been suffering for two weeks already, full of doubt and worry. Or you go to the doctor and they're going to give you a injection, and they bring the needle up close. Already you go, out, And they say, oh, but you haven't had your injection yet. <laughs> and they're just holding it. Why is that? Because well, you've got an attachment to your body. This is me and I don't want a, a needle in it. This is what the Buddha was pointing to. We have a certain delusion. We call it the delusion of self, where we grasp everything as me, mine, myself. And this causes a lot of trouble. Where we can understand this best is when we're suffering. This is the value of suffering. So don't always turn your back on suffering or get angry because you're suffering or complain. See where you can learn. Our teacher Ajahn Chah used to say, if you're attaching to something, it will bring you suffering. So where do we attach in our life? Well, we attach, number one, to this body. So if anything happens to this body, we're not happy. If somebody's, you know, if you're under threat from another person or you're under threat from illness, you get very stressed, don't you? We don't like dangerous situations because we feel something's going to happen to us. 
this body is our number one love, number one attachment. So we suffer a lot over this body. Number two is our family, isn't it? If you have a wife or a husband, you suffer because <laughs> you attach. Anything happens to them, you're, you're attached to them, you're suffering because you're worried about them or concerned about them or maybe you've given up on them <laughs> and they're causing you suffering because they're not doing what you want and not, not following what you want, not following what you like. Where else do we suffer? Children. If you have children, it's more suffering, isn't it? It's not like all easy and happy with children. There's some happiness, but there's a lot of suffering because you attach to them as my children. So my husband, my wife, my child, and on it goes. The people, my friends, you know, we worry about what our friends think of us. Some like us, some don't. Some say one thing, some say another. Our boss, our work colleagues, our neighbors, Ajahn Dhammasiya is worried about the neighbors. What are they going to say? <laughs> <laughs> the more we attach, the more we suffer. This is where we have to learn. And obviously, it's not easy. You can't just give up attachment in one go, but you can start to become aware of it. And where do you become aware of it is when you're suffering. Like one reason monks are very happy is because they don't have partners, wives and children. Ah. Oh, a lot of happiness there. They don't have a house that they have to pay off mortgage off. I'm very happy. <laughs> Why do monks live in the forest with very little? You know, no money, no possessions. Because they've already let go of a lot of attachment. Maybe not yet all their attachment, but they let go of a lot of attachments. They're very happy from that. You can learn something from that. You may not be yet ready to live in a monastery and give it all up. But at least remember, you know, where you attach, the more you attach, the more you're going to suffer. This is why we begin these ceremonies. We make offerings you know, to support the Sangha. Even if just one person comes to the temple, they offer some food, offer something, or hundreds of you come, you offer things. You're practicing letting go of some attachment when you do this. Just to get in your car, come here, make the food, offer it. You have to let go of something, don't you? Maybe your non-Buddhist friends, when you go back tomorrow, they'll say, what did you do yesterday? You know, you go to work, they say, what did you do yesterday? They say, I went to the temple and I offered food and robes to the monks. They say, why do you do that? <laughs> Maybe they won't get it yet. But you're letting go, and when you let go, you're reducing the causes for your suffering. That's what you have to remember this point. You're, you're reducing the causes of suffering by letting go. You're practicing doing this. So sometimes we practice with dana, generosity. We do voluntary work. We help each other. And this is all letting go. On a deeper level, we practice letting go when we practice meditation. Why is it, you know, when you meditate, you learn to focus your mind on one thing? Maybe the breath. You learn to follow the feeling of the breathing. Breathe in, breathe out. You have to let go of everything else when you do that. So why is meditation a little bit tricky at first? Is because your mind doesn't want to let go. You keep thinking. Thinking about home and family and work and holidays and all these different problems you've got. It'll all come up when you meditate. And you have to train yourself to let go by focusing on the breath. And if you naturally focus on the breath, then you will naturally let go of everything else. And the more you focus on the one thing, the less you're thinking about these other things. But even this, some people suffer, don't they? Because they hear the instructions and they said, the monk said, I've got to focus on the breath. So they do that for a few minutes. Can't do it, thinking too much. Then they start suffering because they're thinking too much. And they come back and they say, I can't meditate, I'm thinking too much, and I'm getting very upset by it. So sometimes even meditation seems to produce more suffering. But don't mistake it, it's not the meditation is producing the suffering, the meditation is just showing you how suffering comes up. It's just showing you what's there already. It's not creating new suffering for you. But when you practice meditation, the forest is a good place to practice because it's quiet, not many distractions. That's why it's good to have a monastery in the forest. 
and you're learning to at least temporarily put aside, put down, let go of some of your normal concerns, so like work, socializing, making money, entertainments, all the things we're addicted and, and attached to in life, at least temporarily you learn to put them down and you get a space then. If you let go of something, even for one minute, you've got space in your mind. And that space in your mind is very important. This is like a little taste of Nibbana, a little taste of emptiness. And me just describing it to you as a concept, as an idea, maybe doesn't sound so attractive. You know, empty mind mm, sounds boring. But if you actually try it sometime, try some meditation, put effort into it, if only for 10, 15 minutes, whatever time you've got. And if you successfully put your attention on the breath and let go of some of your other thoughts about family, work, the past, the future, all the normal things, at that time you'll feel very relaxed, very calm, peaceful, and you're experiencing what we call emptiness. And you realize emptiness is actually a very happy experience. It's a good, good experience. It's something desirable that we actually need more in our life. Because normally our mind is not empty, it's very cluttered. It's full of thoughts and desires and wants. And that's why we have so much stress. That's where our attachments come from. So I'd recommend if only one thing you take away from today with you when you go home is at least some maybe some motivation or some wish, mm, I must practice more meditation so I can really understand what the Buddha was pointing to. Offering the dana is good, keeping precepts is good and, and all the different aspects of Buddhist practice, they all help but in the end you really have to practice some meditation to understand what the Buddha was pointing to. Really feel, feel the peace, the happiness in your own heart and then that becomes something you can rely on and you realize that, that peace and happiness in your own heart, no one can steal it, no one can take it away. Even floods and bushfires or wars, they can't take that kind of peace away. It's totally yours. And in that sense, it must be better than all these other things we rely on. Like, you know, your car breaks down, your, your house, maybe you have to sell it one day. Your clothes only last a year or two. Food, 15 minutes. <laughs> Your friends, they're there one day, they're gone another. You know, all the things we rely on and look to for happiness in life, they're not that really that reliable, that secure. But the kind of happiness you get from developing your heart in the Buddhist way, oh, that can last your whole life. And dare I say it, even into your next life, maybe even be a cause for next life having a good rebirth. <laughs> but you don't have to wait to that point to, to prove it, you know, that's a more difficult thing to accept maybe, but this life you can surely find peace and happiness by practicing some meditation. So I'd recommend maybe at least once a day, set aside 15 minutes to practice some meditation. Maybe first thing in the morning, when you get up, before you go to work, before the kids are up, or if you have no kids, just when the house is quiet, do some meditation. Some people do chanting as well, to focus on the teachings of the Buddha. Some people do some meditation, and during that period, just practice letting go of everything. Whatever worries come up, just tell yourself, let them go, let them be, it doesn't matter for 15 minutes. You can afford to let go of all your plans, your worries, all your wanting and attaching to things. Just put it down and see if you can taste some of this happiness that the Buddha was, was pointing to. Once you've done that a few times, you get the message, then you want to do it more. You understand more about the practice. When I first went to stay with Ajahn Anan, who was one of my teachers in Thailand. His, his monastery is surrounded by uh, durian farms. You probably know the durian fruit, large fruit. And I hadn't had much durian or any durian up in Thai, uh, northeast Thailand. When I lived with Ajahn Chah or Wat Nana Chat, where Ajahn Kevali lives, they don't get durian there, they don't grow it. 
maybe now they do. Ajahn Kevali probably has lots of barami and they've probably got platters of durian pouring in, I don't know. But in my day, you didn't get durian. So it was just a kind of a, an idea. Durian, what's that like? And they were always saying, well, durian, it's very smelly. A lot of foreigners don't like it. It's a very tough fruit to eat. So I was always thinking, mm, what's the big deal about durian? So I went to stay with Ajahn and Anand, and walking on arms round the first day or two, I could see them growing on the trees. And they're like huge footballs with spikes. And you look at it, you think it looks more like a weapon than a, than a fruit. <laughs> And the monk said, you've got to try durian. If you never try it, you never know. And I thought, mm, that's what Ajahn Chah said, isn't it, about meditation. He said, if you never try it, you'll never know. Even if you sit here, like I can sit here and explain to you what meditation is like, what it, you know, the benefits, how, how relaxed you feel, how clear you feel, how you, when you let go, the good, good effect it has on your mind. I can explain that to you. But you have to try it, don't you, to really know. So I tried durian and I found, oh, it's very nice. They, a lot of people warned me. They said, you won't like it, it's very smelly, but try it, oh, it's very nice. So maybe meditation is going to be better than you think. Because our own thoughts tend to be our worst enemy, don't they? You think about something hard enough, you'll put yourself off. You'll say, oh, meditation sounds like a lot of trouble, sitting still, you know, not being able to do anything for 15 minutes, not being able to look at my phone for 15 minutes, oh dear, <laughs> sounds like torture. <laughs> but just try it. Maybe you'll find it gives you more happiness than you think, better than you think. Just on a last point, you know, why did the Buddha teach? Why did the Buddha teach the things that we practice here he was teaching things that are for our benefit, for our happiness. He wasn't trying to make life tough for us or give us, make us miserable. He was teaching things that will be for our benefit and for our long-term benefit, not just for today, but for our whole lifetime. So give it a chance. You know, if you have some faith in what the Buddha taught, well, make that grow. Pract try practicing some meditation, then you understand more. One thing he said is that the Sangha, the monks, they're a field of merit. A field of merit, what does that mean? Well, literally it's like a field. If you have a field with good earth in it, you get rain, you've got good quality soil, and you put your seed in it where there's a good chance it will grow. It's a field of merit. The Sangha is a field of merit. If you come to Dhammagiri often and listen to the teachings, participate in the meditation, in the dana offerings, Dhamma discussions, your merit grows because it's a field of merit. And you can't find this in other places in the world. You know, monasteries where there are monks, nuns, sangha together are the best field of merit of all. You know, you go to a shopping mall or you go to a school or you go to work, you 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 may have friends there and do good things and earn money and whatever. Okay, that's good, but it's not a field of merit. You won't come home with merit, much merit in your heart. You may have some, but not much. Whereas you go to a monastery, you go back, you have a lot of good memories, you have knowledge, you have some good feeling you've developed, and you've got a seed that you can grow and build on. And it will, you cultivate that seed, it will bring you more happiness. So don't overlook that. You have a field of merit here or wherever you live, if there's a chance to support Sangha, listen to the Dhamma, practice with Sangha, this will bring you happiness both now and for the future. And so today I'll maybe just say this much and wish you all happiness for now and for the future. May your practice bear you fruit, may it bring you peace and wisdom, less suffering, more happiness. Uh, may you all be free from dangers and free from obstacles in your practice. May you all be healthy and strong and find happiness in the Dhamma. Andamayam damo vadakataya sadhukaram dadamase sadhukaram